We have. Now, you remember yesterday I said that we'd be asking some questions of our speakers oh, that's right. in the morning. Did you forget about that? I should have yeah. told you what I'm going to ask you. You didn't tell me what the questions were yet. Oh, boy. No? Okay. okay. The first one's an easy one. Okay. What's your favorite dessert? Remember, yesterday it was favorite food. Now we're getting a little more specific. I'm trying to think where I am here. I should say pavlova, shouldn't I? I, uh, think, I think that would be a good thing to say. Pavlova's actually Australian, isn't it? No. Oh, well, someone's told me a lie. Uh -oh. I thought it was from Australia. A pavlova will do for this week. Pavlova? For my favorite dessert, yeah. Terrific. Great. Pastor Tyner. What's one of the greatest challenges, in your opinion, that the church is facing today, the world church? I probably should have asked you these questions beforehand, shouldn't I? Well, that's okay. It's, uh, it's a great question. We have a lot of challenges because we're such a diverse people, millions of us now around the face of the earth. I think the, the great challenge to be relevant to people where they live, uh, all of us face different challenges you know, there's a similarity to living the Christian life in the world today, but in the cultures and the language and the situations that we live, it's very different. And we must make Jesus relevant to everybody in their own situation, that he's a very present help in whatever time of need we're in. I think that's a great challenge for mm. us. Very good and very appropriate, um, appropriate answer. Um, this is a question that my little boy actually asked me. And so I'm going to, because I'm missing my family. My family and I get here till February, as I was telling you. And Ryan said to me one morning, Dad, what are you going to enjoy the best about heaven? So, Pastor Tyner, what are you going to enjoy? That's the way Ryan said it. I know it's not too good English, but he's only four. What are you going to enjoy best? About does, heaven. Does he call you pastor? No. No, no, dad. No, dad. dad. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be wonderful to uh, get acquainted with Jesus? I think that's what we're going to to uh, sing about and worship about throughout eternity. And it's not going to be a formality, but the, the reality of the communication system in heaven is that we'll be able to talk to Jesus face to face, thank him for what he's done for us, bask in the warmth of his uh, smile, get a hug from him uh, every time we want it, mm. uh, to be able to say to him, I'm here because of what you have done for me, thank you. It'll be the theme of our song all throughout eternity. 10 million years from today, we'll still be saying the same thing to him. Yeah. And uh, to, to see people that you love that are there and to hear them say to Jesus, I'm here because of what you did. Mm. Boy, that's going to be wonderful. Yeah. That's going to be great. Yeah. Heaven will be a wonderful place, won't yeah, it? This morning for our prayer time, we asked Pastor Tyner if he'd like to stay. Oh, he's got a seat there. That's good. This morning, um, I want to do something that I did the other morning in early morning worship. Um, I haven't been at early morning worship the last couple of days. Jet lag's caught up on me, so somebody's filling in for me. But um, I make it a part of uh, my devotions at times to pray a psalm. And this morning, what I'd like you to do is as I pray, I would like you to close your eyes, but I'm actually going to read a psalm. So let's pray together. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Do not put your trust in princes, in mortal men who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them, the Lord who remains faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the alien and sustains the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the ways of the wicked. 
The Lord reigns forever, your God, O Zion, for all generations. Our Father, we thank you that we can pause in your presence and study your word this morning together. We thank you for the Bible, Lord. We thank you that it is a letter of love to us to show us what you're really like and to reveal your passion for a relationship with us. Lord, we look forward to that day when you come and we can see you face to face. Father, we ask you please bless Pastor, Pastor Tyner this morning as he opens your word to us. May we leave this place blessed by you yourself. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, John, for the music, all of you. When we get to heaven, we'll all have voices as big as John. Won't that be nice? John reminds me of the, the great bass and the Swedish choirs. They had the huge choir with 10,000 sopranos, 10,000 altos, 10,000 tenors, one bass, like John. They were singing the Hallelujah Chorus, and in that big part where there's a, as loud as you can sing, the conductor stopped, looked at the bass, John, he said, not quite so loud, we've got to hear everybody else here. <laughs> yeah, thanks for the music. And thank you for coming this morning on a drizzly day. Stephen tells me this is unusual for your summertime. The temperature's nice. We can work up quite a sweat in here this morning studying, and uh, it'll feel good, won't it? Well, you're a little bit scattered. I don't mind if any of you want to move in close. We've got empty chairs close by. I hope you brought your Bibles with you. Before we open, or maybe on the way to opening to Genesis 28, let me remind you of some presuppositions that we're sharing here about Bible study. The first one is that God is the hero of the Bible stories if we study the Bible correctly. Not Jacob like we look at today, not Abraham or the rich young ruler, not David, not Paul. God is the hero. And as we approach the Bible, it's good for us to say the same thing that Philip said when he said, just show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jeremiah 31.3 says, The Lord appeared to us in the past, saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with loving kindness. That's the face of God that we want to see, this hero that we study. No matter where we look in the Bible, we're going to find that God looking back at us. Secondly, the Bible is God's voice speaking to us today. Not so important what happened back there as a history lesson. It's interesting, fun to study for that, but we miss most of the inspiration unless we apply it to what we face today in our lives. The Bible is God's voice speaking to us today. Romans 15, 4, everything that was written in the past was written to teach us. That's why we study the Bible. And then finally, every Bible story teaches us some way about salvation. 2 Timothy 3.15, the Bible is able to make us wise unto salvation. That's what we're looking for. Every Bible story is going to say something about that. So as we think of those things now, let's turn to Genesis 28. One of the loveliest stories in all of the Bible this is a story where Jacob has left home and he's on his way to where he will spend the next 20 years. And he stops after the first day of the journey. It's late at night. He's tired. He's still tense from all of the trouble that he's been in at home. <coughs> he's looking up at the stars and he feels like if he can just have a good night's sleep, everything will be okay. I felt that way the first uh, few days I've been here. If I could just get to the night and have a good night's sleep, and boy, I've been sleeping well. I know how Jacob felt. He got that stone and put it there in his, underneath his head for a pillow, and he fell fast asleep. And he had this beautiful dream. Do you remember how it goes? 
angels uh, on the stairway going up and down this uh, ladder that reached from earth all the way to heaven. Now let's say right at the beginning of our looking at this story today that God's appearance to Jacob in this dream was not a reward for Jacob's good behavior. God didn't uh, take a look at the last few years of Jacob's life and say, he's such a good boy, I'm going to go and give him a special promise. That's not the way it was. This appearance to Jacob was an evidence of God's graciousness to someone who did not deserve to have the promises that God gave him. Remember the ladder at Bethel was after the lentil stew, it was after the stolen blessing, it was after the grasping, after the deceiving, after the actions that caused anger and bitterness and fury and grudges. It was after Jacob made Esau so angry that Esau decided he would murder his brother. Genesis chapter 27, 41, Esau says, I will kill my brother Jacob. And his anger was justified. Jacob had done some terrible things to Esau. God's appearance in the ladder, at the top of the ladder, was not a reward for the good deeds that Jacob had done. But from the top of the ladder, God promises marvelous things to Jacob. Chapter 28, verse 13. God says, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Verse 14. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. Does this sound familiar to you? It's the same promise that God gave to Abraham, isn't it? Again, coming to a man who does not deserve these promises. God goes on to say in verse 15, I am with you. And you will watch and will watch over you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised to do. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Same way that God talked to Abraham. And by the way, would you like to have God say those promises to you this morning? Look at the words again. I am with you. You woke up this morning, thought about the day ahead of you. Would there have been a more precious promise to you than if God could have whispered audibly to you, I'm going to be with you today? What a promise. I will watch over you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I've promised to do. What a wonderful promise, and if it's true that what was written in the past is written for us to teach us and to tell us these things, these are promises that are for us. There are significant moments in all of our lives when we hear the promises of God just like this to us. Jacob's reaction is the same one that we have. It's an amazing reaction. He wakes up. And he was astonished. How awesome is this place? He says, this is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. So many times in our lives, as we look back on them especially, we see the points when the gates of grace have opened up into our lives. If we had time this morning, you could, tell, you could each tell us of those times in your lives when God opened the gates of grace wide to you and you you thought about how precious those promises are. I can remember a moment in my childhood waking up in my grandmother's house and she would sing, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. 
I didn't understand the theology of that song at the time, but I remember waking up to my grandmother's sweet, even though it was a little squeaky voice. I think the gates of grace were opening up. Many times as I look back on my life story, the gates of grace were opening wide. When we find a willingness in ourselves to move toward that grace, to accept the promises of God, a turning before the returning, a leaving before the cleaving, a responding to God's whisper, a, a saying, I will arise and return to my Father. In my own life, it was often the moment when I, I started to refuse to fight any longer against the gospel. I grew up a good Seventh-day Adventist boy, went to church all of my life in Sabbath school and MV meeting, went in gathering, did all of those things that good Adventist kids are taught to do, went to Adventist schools all my life, took theology in college, studied all the things I was supposed to study, memorized all the verses I was supposed to memorize, but I kept fighting against the good news. I'd read what Paul has to write in some of those epistles in the New Testament, and I would get angry at Paul. He just didn't understand Seventh-day Adventist, I thought. How could he say some of the things that he said? I just wanted to fight against God and the gospel and the good news. And I realize now that every time I struggled with that, it was the gates of grace that were opening up to me. The opening of grace is not a, a condition, but a response. Remember that it's grace that always precedes us. It is grace that awakens the desire for grace in it. Some people think that it was the prodigal son all by himself in a far country in the pigsty that somehow managed enough courage to stand up and say, I'll return to my father. No, it was God's voice whispering and said, it's better in your father's house. He was responding to grace, not generating it himself. I made a cardinal mistake one time as a guest speaker. I was there to talk for church at a church that I didn't belong to and I went to a Sabbath school class to listen in on the discussion. And you know guest speakers are not supposed to talk up in other meetings, just the ones that they're given. And I listened and I listened at this Sabbath school class and the teacher began to talk about things and I was getting uncomfortable and inside me I wanted to talk and break that rule of the guest speaker. And finally he was talking about people who were facing temptation and he used shoplifting as a as an example, you, you're tempted to go to the store and steal, he said, and there's a thing you want and you know where it is in the counter and, and you go right there to, to the store and you're, you're ready to go in. And he said, God can't go into the store with you because you have an evil purpose. So God stands on the outside of the store waiting for you to come out again, standing on the street outside the store and you go in and you're standing there in front of the counter and you're ready to, to steal this thing. And he said, stop what you're doing and run back outside to God. And I finally raised my hand. I couldn't wait anymore. I said, let me disagree with you just a little bit. If God is on the outside of the store and you're on the inside, you won't be tempted to steal because Satan has you exactly where he wants you, away from the presence of God. That's all he needs. But the fact is, if you're beginning to think, should I steal or should I run back to God? It's because God's standing right there next to you, whispering in your ear, don't do it, stay close to me. God doesn't leave us and have us try to screw up the courage to run back home to our Father's house. He's there whispering in our ear. Uh, grace awakens the desire for grace in our lives. Our response of faith is being fully persuaded that God has the power to do what he promises to do. That's where we take part. Instead of walking through the gates of grace that Jacob saw open to him, Jacob turned away. His response after he talks about this awesome place is an interesting one. Chapter 29 of Genesis, 
um, chapter 28, verses um, 20 and 21. And then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me, if God will watch over me on this journey I am taking, and if God will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's house, then the Lord will be my God. If God does what he promised, not a welcoming of his promise and saying, since God has promised, then this is my God. Jacob says, if God does all these things, then I will respond and he will be my God. There are only two basic orientations to the spiritual life. One is a responding to God's goodness, an accepting of his grace, a rejoicing in the promises a trusting that the promises that God makes will be kept. In Christianity, we call this approach a grace orientation. A grace orientation is defined like this. Our place in God's kingdom is assured because of God's great love for us, not because of our good works. Let me say it again. I know you agree with me, but I just want to get it down again. Our place in God's kingdom is assured because of God's great love for us, not because of our good works. The obedience is there. The good works are there. The uh, witnessing is there. The worshiping is there. But they are all there as a response to God's grace. They have nothing to do with our salvation. That's the first approach to spiritual, the spiritual life. The second orientation is a keeping track of the rights and the wrongs, a trying to balance the ledgers, and attempting to pay God back or earn his love or merit his favor. And in Christianity, we call this approach a works orientation. And a works orientation is defined like this. Our place in God's kingdom is awarded to us either in whole or in part in exchange for or because of our obedience, our proper behavior, our correct belief, the strength of our faith, the merits of our Christian life, our acceptance of Christ's grace, or anything else other than the holy, undeserved favor of God manifested to us in Christ Jesus. That's a works orientation. Many professed Christians at the end of the world will have a works orientation. We're told about them in Matthew 7, verse 22. In fact, Jesus tells us the very words that they're on their mouths. Many will say to me on that day, Jesus said, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Do you hear them keeping track of all of the good things that they've done? And Jesus calls them evildoers and says he doesn't even know who they are. Jacob's words reveal a works orientation in his life. It's been there for a long time. And here when God opens the gate of grace to him, his words reveal a works orientation. In Patriarchs and Prophets, pages 197 and 198, Ellen White says this, Jacob's error was now clearly set before him. He had not trusted God's promises, but had sought by his own efforts to bring about that which God would have accomplished in his own time and way. Jacob's words reveal a works orientation. 
Now you and I know people with a works orientation. The Adventist church is full of people with a works orientation. Stephen and Leanne and I were talking on the way out to camp today about how it's endemic in all of us. We're born with a desire to grasp and, and control the situation and say we have to be rewarded for what we are, what we do. In fact, in the world's economy, it is the way of the world. We only get wages when we work. We, we're told to work at our relationships. Children have to work to get good grades in school. In every other part of our life, we have to work. And then suddenly, we come to the spiritual life, and we're told that we don't work to get God's favor. He gives it to you freely as a gift, a free gift of his love. That's what the gospel is. But many of us grasp on, we hold on to our works orientation. And I want to assure you this morning that a works orientation in a spiritual life always ends up with three outcomes. First of all, it always results in a dissatisfying religion. You notice the people, and perhaps you can testify to this as I can in my own life, when you hold on to a works orientation, religion is not something that is full of joy to you. It becomes dissatisfying. And the longer you grasp the works orientation in your life, the more dissatisfying religion comes, becomes. You begin to say religion is about these little tiny things that religion is not really about. And I'm sure today you could tell me some of those things that people say, this is what Christianity is about, this is what Adventism is about, things that are not at the center of our faith. If you ask most young people who leave the church today why they leave the Adventist church, they'll tell you because at the center of Adventism is... Um, no rock music and no dancing and no caffeine. Is there anybody in the tent today who is a Seventh-day Adventist this morning because you, are, because you don't like caffeine and you found a group of people that didn't like caffeine? Is that at the center of anybody's faith here this morning? You know, I've asked that question around the world and no one has ever said yes to me. Why is it that so many young people think that at the center of Adventism is no caffeine and no movies and no dancing and no rock music? At the center of our faith should be Jesus, shouldn't it? Somehow we're giving the wrong impression to so many people. A works-oriented religion is always dissatisfying, and we end up leaving it looking back at all of those things that we tried to put in the center of our faith. The second outcome of a works orientation is that eventually works orientation reveals itself in a judgmental attitude toward everybody else. Because works oriented people can't stand the fact that other people are grace oriented, have joy in their faith, and they begin to say, you're not really religious because you don't have at the center the same things I have. And it's amazing how we do that from culture to culture, from locale to locale, from country to country. We find people with a list of the sins, and these things are okay in some countries. You go next door to the next country, and they're taboo there. You can't do them. And people begin to point their fingers at each other. You're not really a Seventh-day Adventist Christian because you cut your hair differently than I cut my hair or you wear different clothes that I wear or you eat something different than I eat it's amazing a works orientation always reveals itself in a judgmental attitude and finally a works orientation frequently spills out into other aspects of our daily life we don't just keep a works orientation in our spiritual life we begin to put other people on a work strip with us. And that's exactly the case with Jacob. Jacob goes to his uncle Laban's house. He mem remember he begins to work for 
uh, Leah and Rachel, we have this one shining moment in Jacob's life where it says in chapter 29, verse 20, that he, he served seven years to get Rachel, but they seem like only a few days to him because of his love for her. What a wonderful romantic man he was. It's the only good thing the Bible says about him between the beginning of his life and until he finally changes. But his works orientation begins to spill over to his wife, Leah, especially. And there are these amazing uh, notations in chapter 29 and 30. Look at after Leah has her first son, verse 32 of chapter 29, she says, Surely my husband will love me now that I've given him a son. Somehow Jacob had communicated to Leah that she would be loved and accepted as his wife if she finally delivered a son to him. That's not unconditional love, is it? That's not grace, that's a works orientation. It spilled over into his relationship with Leah. Leah has a second child and then a third one. And in verse 34, after her third son, she says, Now at last my husband will become attached to me. The works orientation is deepened. She doesn't even want love from Jacob anymore. Just an attachment will do. My third son I give to him, finally he will feel a little attachment to me. It doesn't happen with a third son. It doesn't happen with a fourth son. It doesn't happen with a fifth son. And finally she has a sixth son. In chapter 30, verse 19, she says, This time my husband will treat me with honor. Gone is the need for love. Gone is the need for attachment. Just Treat me nicely, and I'll be happy. This works orientation has spilled out into his relationship with his wife like a works orientation frequently does. But it wasn't just with, with Leah, probably with his children, probably with others. He begins to work 20 years long. He works for Laban from the first time he goes to work for him until finally he notices in chapter 34 that something is changing in Laban's attitude toward him. Chapter 31, verse 2. And he doesn't know exactly what it is, but folks, people get tired of people when a works orientation, that judgmental attitude, that work strip that they put you on finally grades and was working badly with Laban. And Jacob got the idea he needed to get out of there. He was going to go back. God said, sure, go back to the home you used to have. And so do you remember in secret, Jacob and the wives and the children bundle up the suitcases and they put them on camels and away they go after Laban has gone away to shear the sheep. And Jacob takes off and he goes in one direction, the opposite of Laban. And it's three days before Laban even hears that his family is gone. And he begins to run in the same direction that Jacob and the children and the grandchildren have gone. And it takes him another week to catch up with him. On the way, he takes a, a rest and God says to him, don't hurt this man. Don't hurt him. I've got great plans for him. And so we see in chapter 31 this, this coming together when finally Laban catches up with Jacob. And they sit down and Laban says, what have you done? Why have you taken my daughters and my grandchildren away? And Jacob's Jacob's work orientation spills out toward Laban. Look at verses 38 to 41 in chapter 31. Jacob says, I've been with you for 20 years now. Your sheep and your goats have not miscarried, nor have I eaten rams from your flocks. I did not bring you animals torn by wild beasts. I bore the loss myself, and you demanded payment from me for whatever was stolen by day or night. This was my situation. Do you hear him keeping track of all of the things, all of the good things, all the bad things? He's got it all in the list, doesn't he? The heat consumed me in the daytime and the cold at night. The sleep fled from my eyes. It was like this for 20 years I was in your household. I worked for you 14 years for your two daughters and six years for your flocks, and you changed my wages 10 times 
He's got it all written down. And Laban just sat, sits there, amazed at the venom spilling out from this works-oriented man. And then something absolutely amazing happens. God has also been working with Laban. You know, the Bible story is not just one track, but all kinds of things are going on at the same time. You wouldn't have guessed that Laban would be the gatekeeper to the gates of grace, knowing what we know about crafty old Laban. But here Laban is opening the gates of grace to his son-in-law, Jacob. Laban responds in grace. He says, you know what? Let's part friends. <laughs> May the Lord watch between you and me while we're away from each other. He says, don't let me hear that you ever hurt my daughters, though. I'll come after you if you do that. You take good care of the daughters, and I'll be okay. And then the Bible tells us that early the next morning, Laban kissed his grandchildren and his daughters and blessed them and left and returned home. And now Jacob is the one standing there with his mouth open, expecting the worst from his father-in-law. He has been met only with grace and kindness and good wishes. You never know who it is that opens the gate of grace or how it is that those gates are opened. It's a good thing to watch out as you go through the day. The people that you meet, the people you live with, the people you're sitting next to right now, you may be the person that opens the gates of grace to them. I have a friend who had a very unhappy home. She was an only child. Her mother and father were fighting. Her mother was a uh, Seventh-day Adventist. Her father was not. She was um, 15, 16 years old. Was thinking about running away from home. Couldn't take the fighting in her home anymore. Her mother was uh, not very well. In fact, she was allergic to all kinds of things including tobacco smoke, and she believes that it was because of the allergy that her father took up smoking, just to be mean. He smoked all day long. The mother coughed, walked outside to get fresh air. Finally, my friend couldn't take it anymore. One night, late at night, packed a bag early in the morning, went out the back door of the house, ran away, went into the city, lived for a few months away from her parents. They didn't know where she was. She didn't communicate with them. And in those few months that she was in the city, she picked up some bad habits. You'd think that somebody who had come from that particular home wouldn't do what she did, but she started smoking. And after a few months, uh, kind of unhappy with her life, missed her mom and her dad. She took a bus, went back home, Late in the afternoon, knocked on the back door. Her mother answered the door, and there was the girl that she hadn't seen for 10 months. The mother threw her arms around her, welcomed her in. They sat at a little table in the kitchen and began to talk. The girl was telling her mom everything that she'd been doing. Well, not quite everything that she had been doing. And the girl noticed that the air in the house seemed fresher than it used to, and it was quiet and peaceful and she kept looking around and she finally said where's dad mom said you know shortly after you left uh, dad left too We're, our divorce is final he's not here anymore haven't heard from him for a few months my friend thought that was interesting was interested in the cleanness in her house and and the the smile on her mother's face and and mother said, would you like to sleep in your bed tonight? And the girl did, went up the stairs, went into her bedroom, unpacked her suitcase, slept that night for the first time in 10 months in her home, in her own bed. Next morning, she was sitting on top of her bed, kind of organizing things, and her mother was cheery on the other side of the house, and 
Finally, the mother stopped by the bedroom and she said, I, I've got to go to the grocery store. Is there, is there anything you'd like for me to pick up for you? And the girl said to me, my friend said, I, I realized that I needed to test my mother's love. And she said, Mom, I've started smoking. Would you get me a carton of my favorite cigarettes? And she said what they were. Allergic mother looked at her, smiled, left the room. And an hour or so later, when mom came back, the girl was sitting on her bed still. She heard her mother downstairs unpacking the groceries, and she said, I wonder what mom's done. And all of a sudden, mom walked up the stairs, came into her room, and said, here's what you asked me to get. Put a carton of cigarettes down on the bed. You know, I don't think I would have done it that way. I don't know if you would have or not. But the girl said to me, she looked at her mother, she looked at the carton of cigarettes, and to this day, she's never had the urge to smoke again. You never know what it is that opens the gates of grace. Unconditional love toward people who don't deserve it. When we exhibit it to other people, sometimes it tears down the barriers. It introduces them again to God, and they walk through the gates of grace. Laban responds to Jacob in grace. Jacob is moved, and the wrestling for merit begins to stop. The works orientation begins to melt. He goes out that night preparing to meet his old enemy, his brother Esau, and he kneels down and he prays. Now listen to the words of this prayer and listen to the changed man that we're beginning to be introduced to. Genesis 32, beginning with verse 10. He says, I am unworthy, God, of all of the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. This is a different man sp speaking. A day earlier, he had all of the lists of how worthy he was. Now he kneels down. He says, I'm unworthy of all the kindness and the faithfulness you've shown your servant. I only had my staff when I crossed this Jordan, but now... I have become two groups of people. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid. But you have said, I will surely make you prosper, will make your descendants like the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted. The next night, Jacob is wrestling again, but this time with God. And when he understands that our wrestling cannot prevail with God, he holds on as tightly as he can, and he says, I will not let you go until you bless me. And his name, like Abraham's name before, is changed. Finally, when Jacob, now Israel, meets his brother, he is a different man. Esau says, who are these people? Jacob says, these are the children that God has graciously given your servant. When he gives a gift to his brother, he says to Esau, please accept the present that was brought to you, for God has been gracious to me, and I have all I need. What a change. When Jacob finally walks through the gates of grace and camps in the camp of God, works oriented people constantly grasping, always keeping a list, grace oriented people understanding that God has given us all that we need. Don't you want to be among God's grace oriented people today? In Patriarchs and Prophets, page 197, Ellen White says, Now his was the assurance 
of one who confesses his own unworthiness, yet trusts the faithfulness of a covenant-keeping God. Who's the hero of this story? The covenant-keeping God. What kind of God is he? One that gives people who don't deserve great blessings, continue, continuously giving them what they need. As he speaks to you and me this morning, let's thank him for being that kind of God. Father in heaven, we are reminded again through another one of the stories you've left behind of what your face looks like. And we see it again as a gracious face, a covenant-keeping, promise-making, trustworthy God. We thank you for inspiring us to obey and follow you and witness to your love by your everlasting, enduring grace in our behalf. Thank you for being this kind of God to us this morning, in this place, at this time. And may we, may our faces so shine with the light from your face that we might be the openers of the gates of grace to others this day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And I, I know that your heart is good and you, you want to help me, but what I'm telling you is I don't need help. I'm God. I can do what I promise. I have the power to do what I promise. Is it a message, incidentally, that you and I need to hear? Does it ever feel like God isn't doing what he promises? This story says to us, God has the power to do what he promises to do. Listen to God as he promises. You don't need to help him. He can fulfill his promises. And then finally, you would think, after all of this, with God standing in front of them saying, I'll come back in a year and you'll have a child, you'd think that Abraham and Sarah would know. But before we get to the birth of Isaac, we have to go through one more story in chapter 20 with this uh, King Abimelech. And here we find that Abraham has not been learning his lesson very well. So he tells Sarah one more time, tell him, you're my sister. Sarah's 90 years old. She must have been a beautiful woman because Abraham is still worried that he's going to get killed before Isaac is born because of his beautiful wife. And so one more time he tries to help God out. And it must have been such a relief to God when Isaac was finally born. Maybe now, Abraham would learn the lesson. It seems like Sarah learned the lesson. Sarah says, in, uh, as we get into the story of uh, the birth of Isaac in chapter 21, the Lord was gracious to Sarah as he had said. The Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. And verse 6 says that Sarah said, God has brought me laughter. You think of that whenever your children are born, your grandchildren were born. When our first daughter was born, our first child, our daughter, my wife turned over and looked at her and said that she looked just like me and started to laugh. I'm not sure I appreciated that too much, but Karen always knows what it means when Sarah said that God brought me laughter. Sarah seems to be happy, seems to be giving the, the glory to God, and Hebrews 11, verse 12 says, And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. And now we come to Genesis 22. The birth of Isaac has happened. In between the birth of Isaac and the sacrifice of Isaac, a few years pass, and we don't know much about what was going on in Abraham's life, but there is a clue in the 11th chapter of Hebrews. If you can hold your finger in chapter 22 and look at Hebrews 11, the great faith story, 
we go through the beginnings of the, the Hall of Fame of Faith there. We see uh, the beginning story of the birth of Isaac in Abraham's life. And then before we get to the sacrifice of Isaac in Hebrews 11, there is an interesting interlude. Notice it begins in verse 13, when the writer of Hebrews 11 says, all these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things that they had, pro that the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, and they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. Verse 13. 14 and 15, 16 go on to say, people who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. But if they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had the opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And then Hebrews 11 goes into the sacrifice of Isaac. Is there a clue for us Bible students here, the beginning of the year 2002, that as Abraham began to relax with the birth of the son that God had promised would be the son of inheritance, as he began to look around at the land that he possessed that God had given him, and the wealth that had collected, and his lovely family, as he began to relax about things on earth and thank God for fulfilling the promise, his mind turned to a heavenly city and he began to think about how he was going to get to heaven ultimately. Is it possible that as he was growing older, like many of us do as we get older, we begin to wonder back on our lives and we begin to think, is God going to give me a heavenly home? Have I been faithful? Have I uh, stood for the right? Have others seen Jesus in me? You know the song that we used to sing? Is it possible that Abraham began to think about the heavenly country and that was where his mind was when Genesis 22 begins? The traditional interpretation, you know, of Genesis 22 is good for Abraham for obeying an arbitrary God. Good for Abraham for knowing the voice of God even when God says, murder the son that you love. Good for him for obeying. The traditional interpretation is that God did not feel that he had Abraham's heart fully, and so he gave him a test. If you love me more than you love this son, and when he comes to him, he says, your only son, the son that you love, Isaac, if you do that, then you can prove that you love me. How would you pass such a test? I have never appreciated this test very much. I have three grown children, if God came to me at night and said to me, I want you to take your oldest son, Matthew, whom you love, take him out onto a hill that I will show you and kill him. I know exactly what I would say. I would wake up in the morning and say to my wife, the devil is tempting me to do something that I shouldn't do. I would not have no question in my mind that this was not the voice of God. But the traditional interpretation is God knew the voice of God because he'd heard it all his life. And if God says, kill your children, that must be what we, we want to do. I've struggled with that interpretation. I hope you have struggled with it too. I hope none of you this morning are ready to jump up at your, out of your chair and run and find your children and kill them because you think that's what God wants you to do. The, the contemporary rabbinical interpretation of this story is good for Abraham for exposing an unjust God. The rabbis are teaching these days that Abram listened to this voice of an unjust God 
and he went out, but he did not kill him. They say it wasn't the angel that stopped Abram's hand. It was Abram's intelligence that finally said, this is an unjust God, I will not do it. And Abraham becomes the hero in the rabbinical tradition now because he is opposing an unjust God. Are we, are we down to that? Is that the only interpretation that's left to us? If we don't think that the traditional one of, of a God that's arbitrary telling Abram to kill his children, if that's not right, are we left with an unjust God? I can't go there either, I'm afraid. There must be another way to interpret it. Could there be a clue to how we interpret this chapter in Genesis? In Galatians 3.8, let me quote it to you. You don't need to look at it. It says this, the gospel was announced in advance to Abraham. We haven't talked much about the gospel in the life of Abraham. Is there in Galatians 3.8 a hint, a clue, on how to better interpret this story? And is it the same thing that Ellen White is talking about in the chapter of Patriarchs and Prophets on this test of Abraham when she says it was to impress Abraham's mind with the reality of the gospel that God commanded him to slay his son? Is there the gospel story in what's going on? Well, for there to be there, let's think of again, in the context of thinking about eternal life, could the old pattern of feeling like he needed to help God have returned to Abraham? Do we have any reason to believe that it had not returned? Could Abraham had been one, be wondering now if he had done enough to prove to God that he was worthy of being saved? Could he have been saying, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life, like the rich, young, eager ruler that we talked about yesterday in church? Could the test have been, not is he obedient enough, but what is he still lacking to understand God? Could God be saying, after all I've tried to teach him, does he still not understand? If you're still trying to help me, Abraham, this time trying to help me get you to heaven, maybe I can teach you a lesson by a powerful illustration. And so verse 2 of chapter 22 says that God says to Abraham, take your only son Isaac, whom you love, and sacrifice him as a burnt offering. And apparently Abraham accepts the proposal. He gets up in the morning to do exactly what he was asked to do, but while he has accepted the proposal, apparently he can't bear to speak the truth. To Sarah, he says not a word. He sneaks out of the tent, takes a couple of servants, takes Isaac, and he leaves. After a while of journeying, he sees the mountain that God has said to him, Mount Moriah. And he says to the servants, Isaac and I will worship over there and then we'll come back. Thinking that he was going there to sacrifice Isaac. And on the way up the mountain, Isaac says to dad, we have the wood for the sacrifice, we have the knife, we have the fire. Where's the sacrifice? And Abraham turns to the son that he thinks he's about to kill, and he says, um, oh yeah, God will provide the sacrifice. A prophetic utterance. But he didn't believe it. He was telling him something to get his mind off of what was happening. And so the story tells us that Abraham binds Isaac on Mount Moriah, places him on the altar, begins to sacrifice him, raises the knife to plunge it into the heart of his son. And an angel reaches down and grasps Abraham's wrists and says, don't harm the child. Look, there's a ram in the thicket. What did Abraham learn from the lesson? Is there anything we can turn to now and, and say, we know for certain that Abraham caught the meaning that God intended to give him by this 
Incredibly powerful illustration. Well, in fact, there is. Verse 14 of chapter 22 says that on the way down the mountain, after sacrificing the ram, after, uh, after a wonderful scene of reunion with Isaac, Abraham stops and he looks back up to the mountain to the altar and he says, verse 14, Abraham called this place, the Lord will provide. And then the Bible says this marvelous thing, and to this day it is said. I love it when the Bible says that. To this day, whenever the chapter was written, probably by Moses much, much later, when God told him the stories of the beginnings. But to this day, the day that you and I sit here in the big tent, it's still there. It's still being said. To this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. That's the lesson that Abraham learned. You know where Mount Moriah is? You do. Moriah is that great mountain on top of which sits Jerusalem. And suddenly Abraham looked at the altar where he almost tried to sacrifice his son, perhaps to try to help God save him. If I'm this good, if I will do this much, if my works are this strong, will that guarantee I have a place in heaven? And he realizes that God provides the sacrifice. We don't provide the sacrifice. We get to the heavenly city because on the mountain it is provided. God provides the sacrifice. What a wonderful preview of what would happen there in Jerusalem. The reality of the gospel is found in Romans 3, verses 23 to 25. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus, whom God presented as a sacrifice of atonement. Who's the sacrifice that God provides? Jesus is. Any question in your mind? The sacrifice that is provided on Mount Moriah is Jesus. 1 John 4.10 This is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Is this a story about a hero named Abraham and his good works? Or is it a story about a hero named God and what he does for us. When Paul wrote to the church in Romans, he, in, he devoted chapter 4, what we know today as chapter 4, to this same story. Beginning with verse 1, he says, what are we going to say about Abraham, our forefathers? What did he discover in this matter? Was he justified by works? If he was, he had something to be boastful about, but not before God. Notice verse 4 and 5. Now when a person works, his wages are not credited to him as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts God who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited as righteousness. What we learn from the Abraham story is the same thing that Paul wanted the church in Rome to learn from the story of Abraham and Isaac. It is not our works that provide the sacrifice that justifies us and gets us to the heavenly city. It's God who justifies. And what our part in the bargain is believing is having the faith. Notice what Paul continues to say to the church in Rome over in uh, verse 20 and 21. Abraham was strengthened in his faith and he gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God has the power to do what he promises to do. That's the message that we need to get from the story. Finally, perhaps God broke the pattern in Abraham's life of Abraham trying to help God out. Finally, the one last illustration helped Abraham understand that God has the power to do what he promises. That's what faith is. That's the definition of faith having trust in God that he has the power 
to do what he promised to do. You and I, this morning, have been promised that God will save us. He sent his son into the world to be a sacrifice so that every one of us who believe that he has the power to do what he promises can go to the heavenly city. It's the same lesson for us to learn today. Ellen White uh, wrote a book called Faith and Works. On page 24, she approaches this subject like this. I ask myself, how can I present this matter as it is? The Lord Jesus imparts all the powers, all the grace, all the penitence, all the inclination, all the pardon of sins in presenting his righteousness for humans to grasp by living faith, which is also the gift of God. If you would gather together everything that is good and holy and noble and lovely in humanity. Not just in the life of Abraham, not just in the life of one of you saints here, but gather together, together everything that is good and holy and noble and lovely, and then present the subjects to the angels of God as acting a part in salvation of the human soul, or in merit, just a part, the proposition would be rejected as treason. Is that pretty clear? Say to the angels that all the good things put together in humanity act just a part in salvation, and the proposition would be rejected as treason. Standing in the presence of their Creator, and looking upon the unsurpassed glory which enshrouds his person, they are looking upon the Lamb of God given from the foundation of the world to a life of humiliation, to be rejected of sinful humans, to be despised, to be crucified. Who can measure the infinity of the sacrifice? What we have to accept is that God provides the sacrifice. And the gospel to Abraham is the gospel to you and me. On the mountain, God will provide the sacrifice that gets us to the heavenly city. What do we learn from the story? Who's the hero, the hero of Genesis 22? Abraham or God? It's God. Who, what do we know about this hero called God? From everlasting he has approached us with a salvation that is a gift to us. What do we find out about salvation? That he wants to give it to us, but that he wants us to know he provides the sacrifice we don't. Let's agree to learn the lesson together today of Abraham in Genesis 22. Let's pray. Father, we pause just a moment longer to praise you, to give you glory for the infinite sacrifice beyond all understanding of human hearts, beyond the capabilities to fathom it of the angelic host, beyond the comprehension of the unfallen worlds throughout the universe, somehow in the goodness of your gracious heart, you decided to give to us that which it is impossible for us to earn by ourselves. No amount of good things that we do, no amount of trying to help you out can get us to the heavenly city. But we know this morning that that right has been given to us because of what Jesus did and who Jesus is. And because this morning we accept him and his life and death and resurrection in our behalf. And at this moment, we stand before you and the throne of grace just as if we had not sinned. We glory in this moment with you and thank you and praise you for it. In the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, amen.